Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Sedgemoor District Council's Community Scrutiny Advisory Committee meeting. My name is um, Councillor Hilary Bruce, I'm chair of this committee. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Leila Nicholson, committee manager, who's going to go through a bit of housekeeping with us. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to say, we're recording this meeting as per our normal uh, policy. Uh, if, if for any reason you drop out, if you can just let us know one way or another. Um, but the main thing is if you could keep yourselves uh, with your camera on and your mute button pressed. If you wish to ask a question or speak, if you can go to the reactions and raise your hand uh, as per that, uh, it's easier for us to track. OK, and if you can remember to take it off as well for the end. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Um, OK, I'm going to go through um, each committee member and officer who's taking part in the meeting today. Um, if you could please introduce yourselves and confirm that you can see and hear me um, before we start the official business of the committee. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Councillor Liz Scott. Um, good afternoon, Chairman. Yes, Councillor Liz Scott from the Axvale Ward. Um, I'm Deputy Chairman of this committee and I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Alexia Bartlett. Uh, hello, uh, Councillor Alexia Bartlett of uh, Dunware Ward. Um, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Anthony Betty. Good afternoon, Chairman. Councillor Anthony Betty of the King's R Ward. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Peter Clayton. No, OK. Uh, Councillor Barry Crow. No. Councillor Graham Godwin Pearson. Graham Godwin Pearson here, representing Axvale Ward. We're well represented here in the north bit of Sedgemoor. Um, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Phil Harvey. Uh, Phil Harvey, Burnham Central, I can see and hear. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Liz Levy. Councillor. Councillor Liz, you're muted. Sorry, Councillor Liz Levy from Hamp Ward in Bridgewater. I can hear, but I can't see. You can't see? No, I can't see you. Oh. D does it matter? I can hear perfectly well. Probably shouldn't matter for the business today, Layla. Sufficient that she can hear? Um. No, it's just that when we get the presentation, that might be a little bit more difficult, but um, you can listen to it. OK, but you won't be able to see it if that's the case. I'm not sure. I don't know whether it's worth co going out and then coming back in again. Try that. I'll try that. All right. OK, thank you. And uh, Councillor Rodriguez. Not here. Uh, Councillor Gary Wong. Yeah, uh, Councillor Gary Wong of Loft Pepperton. I can see and hear everyone. Lovely, thank you. Um, and we have um, officers here today. Um, obviously, I'll start with uh, Lena Nicholson, Democratic Services. Thank you, Chairman. Lena Nicholson, um, I'm the committee manager for today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I can see and hear everybody that is Lovely. here. Thank you. Rose Stokes. Is Rose with us? Rose is on hold by the looks of it. Yeah, she, yeah, she's answering. A, oh, Councillor Rodriguez has just arrived. OK, I will continue through the officers for the moment. Um, Catherine Church. Hello, everyone. Um, I can hear and see everything. Thank you, Catherine. And Pete Granger. Hi, folks. Um, I can hear and see everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Christy Blackwell. Good afternoon, everyone. Christy Blackwell, Strategic Manager for Community Resilience and Climate Change, and I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dave Coles. Dave Coles is coming in later, actually. Um, and we have um, Doris O'Farrell. 
Thank you, Chair, Legal Advisor to Committee, and I can hear and see everything. Thank you. Um, we have Anna Mears with us today. So. Yeah, hi, Anna Mears here. Um, from Emergency Graduate Support, I can see and hear everything. Libby, thank you. Um, Rose, I asked you earlier, but I think you were on hold for a minute. Yes, hello, uh, Rose State Scrutiny Officer, and I can see and hear everything. Lovely, thank you. And um, Councillor Diego Rodriguez. Hi, yeah, here now, um, Bridgewater Dunware, thank you. Lovely, thank you. Leila, is Liz back with us? Is she here? is, she is, yeah. Well, she seems to be. Yeah, and I can see you now. <laughs> oh, perfect, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, have I missed anybody out in terms of officers? No, all here. Uh, we have a couple of guests with us today from the Somerset Environmental Records Centre as well. Um, we have Leon DeBell and Ellen Philpott, and I'll come to their instructions later if that's OK. Yes, great, thank you. OK. Um, as Leila mentioned earlier, it's much easier if you want to speak, if you can use the virtual hands up feature uh, just to help us track it. Um, and so I'll start with the business, the agenda. Um, with uh, Before I go on to the apologies, um, I'd just like to say that there has been um, a slight change in committee members um, from this, this meeting today. Um, and Councillor Liz Levy, Liz Levy has replaced Councillor Lee Gibson. Um, so I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Councillor Lee Gibson for her contribution to the committee and to extend a warm welcome to Councillor Liz Levy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, apologies. Um, Leila, I have had apologies through from Councillor Keane because of a clash with another meeting. Um, I don't know whether she might turn up a bit later on in the meeting, but possibly not. Um, do you have any other apologies for today? Oh, Councillor Keane looks as if she has joined us. She seems to be on there. So, Hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm sorry to disrupt your uh, flow of thought. No, that's great. Lovely to have you with us, Councillor. Councillor Keane, thank you. OK, any other apologies, Leila? No. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, OK, so any urgent business? No, Chairman. OK, do we have any public speakers registered today? No, Chairman. Lovely. Any declarations of interest from anyone in, of the committee members? No? OK, great. So I'm going to move on to item five of the agenda. Um, we are on the topic of the ecological emergency. Um, so let me just give you a brief introduction onto this. Um, so I'm going to just going to go a bit background really in terms of, of how we got to this item today. Um, in March 2019, um, Sedgemoor District Council declared a climate emergency. Um, and as part of this work, there was a piece of research commissioned through Somerset Climate Action Network to establish the views of the public. Uh, their report recommended for Sedgemoor to signal the renewed priority it intends to give to increasing biodiversity by declaring an ecological emergency. Um, this led the Community Scrutiny Committee to request an overview of the purpose and implications from declaring an ecological emergency in Sedgemoor. A report was presented to the committee in March 2021 and a cross-party working group was set up um, to work alongside officers to draft the declaration. Um, the committee met again in September 2021, and although the State of Nature Partnerships 2019 report showed a decline in species and habitats nationally, it was noted that there was no local evidence base to establish a focused action plan. As a result, recommendations then went to executive for the Somerset Environmental Records Centre to be commissioned to carry out a piece of work to establish a clear local evidence base and understanding of habitat and species which are in decline or under threat in the Sedgemoor area. We received an update on this work at the committee in March this year um, and the report has now been finalised and circulated. So we have with us today um, uh, Leon and Ellen from um, CERC and I'll let them introduce themselves. What I'm going to do is hand over to Leon first um, because he's going to present us an update Sort of a brief summary of the report and an update now that it's been finalised for you. OK, thank you, Leon. Thanks, Hilary. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Ellen, are you able to share the presentation for us, please? Excellent, thank you. Um, so for most of you, you will have seen all of this the last time we presented. We were pretty much wrapping up on the work um, when we presented to the group last time. Um, so there's not going to be, there's, well, there's not any change in the presentation itself, but we'll just go through everything again so that we can kind of reiterate what we were talking about last time. Uh, next slide, please. So the work encompassed two key areas, which were habitats and landscape um, and species. And as we'll come on to see, the habitats and landscape gave us a lot more information around the state of um, nature within Sedgemoor than what the species work did. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with habitats and landscape, the three areas that we looked at were designated sites, which are things like triple SIs, SACs, SPAs, all the nationally recognized statutory designations. Uh, we also looked at water quality. So this was all taken from the environment agency data just to establish what the condition of Sedgemoor's waterways were like. And we also looked at land cover change. Um, and now reading that bullet point, I've just realized that we've not actually put the land cover change slide in, but I will talk through it. Um, so starting off with the designated sites, these are all the nationally um, recognised statutory sites within Sedgemoor. Um, and as we can see, some of them cross boundaries as well, because as we're aware, nature doesn't kind of conform to human made boundaries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are the really important ones to understand within Sedgemoor. So the triple SIs are some of the original designations for what would have been considered good quality examples of natural habitat within the UK, or and in this case within Sedgemoor. Um, so ideally, all of this should be in favourable condition. Um, it should be our, our best examples of habitat within any given planning authority, county, or whatever scale it might be. Um, as we can see from here, there's quite a lot of in unfavourable condition, uh, some declining. We've even lost a very small part of the triple SI as well. Um, and it's also really important to note the size of Bridgewater Bay. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Basically, what we're seeing here is the kind of estuarine system of Bridgewater Bay. It tips it in favour to say that most of the triple SIs within Sedgemoor are in good condition. When in actual fact, if we take that out and actually look at the terrestrial um, triple SIs, we've got a huge problem because the majority are in an unfavourable declining um, condition which is, is not good um, and is a bad indicator for um, the ecology of Sedgemoor. Uh, next slide, please. These are the river conditions. So this is the environmental agency data that we looked at for the um, water quality metrics. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, please. And basically what this is telling us from the 23 catchments that were looked at within Sedgemoor, there's been a slow decline from good condition to mainly moderate. Now, this is not the unfortunate thing here is that um, river systems like the Parrot and the Brew, it might be very difficult to actually get them beyond a moderate condition because they've been um, man managed and kind of straightened in places. So they're not entirely natural river systems. So it could be quite difficult. However, there are areas where um, water bodies could be improved to raise up some of those good statuses and get um, Sedgemoor back on track to kind of improve in its water quality. Obviously, there's a lot of nutrient pollution issues around the Somerset levels and moors, which will have an impact as well. Uh, next slide, please. And Ellen's gonna be taking over now, sorry. Hi, yeah, so I'm just gonna quickly talk through some of the species data. Um, as Leon has said, not a huge amount could be drawn from the species data. Uh, and most of that is summarised here. So we had a, a large number of data entries. We had a, uh, just over 500,000 data entries. But after doing some cleaning and taking out the data that we could actually use uh, for analysis, um, then we have just over 300,000. Quite a lot was taken out. Um, we found 43 different taxon groups and just over 7,000 different species throughout a span of around 200 years. Um, in that, we have 162 red listed species um, and 33 invasive species.
So just to reiterate again, so some of the issues uh, was that we had a larger number of species, so over 7,000 species, quite a lot, um, but uh, uh, just over 6,000 of those species had 10 or less data entries we couldn't be used and only 60 species had a, over a thousand data entries so it was a small number of species we could actually focus on to do any analysis a lot of the data we had some for about five years and then we wouldn't have anything reported for a couple of years after that so we couldn't make any long-term um, summary uh, of those species The only species really that we could focus on was the hazel dormouse. So it's both a, a red listed species and it's a county notable. So it's something that Sedgemoor, um, it's important to Sedgemoor and the populations are also important. So from uh, 1990, we had the most data for this. And then towards the end of the years, the mo more recent years, they've plateaued. Um, this is the number of individuals per survey. So it's just the mean number throughout the years. Um, and as you can see from the next slide, so the number of surveys that were being done um, in terms of finding evidence of hazel dormouse increased, as well as uh, the size and the area that the hazel dormouse were being studied in. But from the previous slide, you can see that the number of individuals actually found hasn't increased. So there's some negative trends um, in the populations of hazel dormouse. The most important one that we found species wise was the invasive species. So as I said before, there was 33 invasive species that have been found in Sedgemoor over around the last 180 years. The peak of this was in 2014, where 22 individual um, invasive species were found just in one year. Um, and the cover of this in the last 10 years is now 246 kilometers squared. So there's a large area of Sedgemoor that has invasive species. And this obviously has a negative effect on um, the native species in Sedgemoor. Um, so that needs to be tackled. And then just to lay on to sum up. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, and just before I summarize or finish on these last two summary slides, um, the one area where we, I'd, I'd forgotten to put the slide in was the land cover change as well. So um, if we go back to, I think it was 1998, the plant life had done a study within the UK and estimated that 97% of our species rich grassland had been lost throughout the UK. Um, when we've actually looked at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology um, data for land cover change within Sedgemoor, we've actually seen a continuation in the loss of um, grassland habitats um, with a small increase in woodland, but mainly a larger increase in um, agricultural land so the grasslands have been shifting in their land use essentially um, but just to summarize uh, essentially the random intermittent surveys that we have and the data that's been collected in the past has made trend analysis difficult so we're trying to answer questions now that we haven't really prepared for um, we didn't know that we were going to be needing to answer these and we've not collected the right kind of data to really sort of dig in and, and give us a huge amount of information however with things like the dormouse, where we've got a structured survey, um, it's repeated um, and it's it's consistent. Um, things like detection probability can be used, and in that case, we saw a, a decline in the population of dormouse. That was kind of it fits with what the national decline is estimated. So that seems to be um, a good quality outcome as far as data is concerned for that particular species. Really. Um, with regards to calling an ecological emergency, a part of that should be trying to work out what species you need to monitor and then developing monitoring methods that will answer the questions that you want to know about those species. So if you're trying to find out if a species is declining, then it very much needs to be a, a methodology that will help collect the right kind of data to answer those questions. Um, it should be noted though that targeted species surveys, they can be resource intensive. We're talking about people needing to go out on a regular basis into lots of um, known locations and repeating the same process over and over again to collect a long term data set that will actually start to give you some meaningful information. It can't be something that's done as a one off. It's not something that can be um, 
kind of it's not a rapid process essentially um, so it would need to be ongoing uh, next slide please and a couple of other points as well so the majority of environmental dam damage had happened pre-record um, if we look at the literature we're going back to sort of the industrial revolution and even prior to that as well so we're looking at around the 1600s and then around the 1800s and we weren't really keeping um, strong records of of our environment at that point um, however just because we can't actually show it doesn't mean it didn't happen um, we do know that it's kind of happened and the natural history museum have got an excellent metric to show how the uk as a whole is one of the most um, habitat or ecologically denuded countries within the european union um, and We've also found that habitat data at this point still provides a better metric for looking at or highlighting the ecolog ecological damage that's happened in a given location. Um, again, just to kind of come back to the land use change, it's it's only a small percentage, it's about 4%, but Sedgemoor is still losing its natural habitats to urbanisation and agriculture. Um, and obviously like compound interest, if this happens periodically over time, then that compounds into a large much larger area and is much more significant um, and also as well we know that if habitats are being damaged degraded or fragmented then the scientific research tells us that species will suffer they can't move as easily they become trapped and isolated populations start to decline we will lose species um, and we do see this in the literature elsewhere um, and i think that's it so thank you very much for listening and i think there's a hand up as well There is. Sorry, I have a slow connection and I'm trying to unmute myself, but the symbol wasn't going away. Can you hear me? I can I can hear you. Okay. Can hear you. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I wanted to take questions at the end. Yeah, that's right. So um, we have Councillor Graham Goblin Pearson with his hand up. Yeah, it's just a super quick question following what we what we just heard, and that is about the data collection. And I, I, I know I know it's tough getting data, but um, do any of our uh, do we have any partners that might be able to provide an insight into some of this data? I mean, you know, the the uh, RSPB has the annual bird count, for example, and things like that. I mean, is there anything like that that we can t citizen data? Is there anything like that we can tap into? There is, yes. Yeah. So this this is going to be, so what we've done with the state of nature work, and we're doing this for every planning authority, and we're going to be doing it for the county as a whole. This is a first phase, so we needed something quick that we could turn around to try and start answering this question. With the species data, we've got so much of it um, that it's it takes a lot of effort and time to pick through and actually start working out which bits we can use. Obviously, we do have things like the webs counts that go on. We know at Steert Marshes that there's been a lot of successes as far as um avocets and things like that breeding pairs that's a wetland environment in a marine estuary so it's kind of different from the terrestrial systems um so we just meet, need to make sure that we're picking out the right data for the right spots but there will be partners like you say the rspb the bto um there was you know we have some metrics that are kind of further inland on the somerset levels and moors around um west hay and whatnot where we know some of the declines around um, bird species and things like that but it's 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 it is a long process, even with the data that we have, just to kind of pick through it all. Thanks, Leon. Um, Councillor Scott. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, invasive species is this mainly along our waterways, or is it general? Because I can think of quite a few that are on the waterways um, that gets that get transferred. Um, but there's also things like oilseed rape that seems to be sort of creeping in everywhere. Did you want to answer Ellen or are you happy for me? To yeah. yeah, so the large majority are um, plants. They're the main um, issues in terms of invasive species, but there are also um, quite a few birds and some mammals as well that are have been found that shouldn't be found. Uh, but yeah, the main thing is plants. There is some along the waterways, but grasslands as well has a, a large number of invasive species in them. Okay, thank you. And um, Councillor Keane. Thank you. A uh, part answer to Graham's um, question is I know that the Somerset Wildlife Trust does do 
various audits, but I, I don't know what their structure is because I, I, I haven't been on one. Um, and I would assume that they are one of our partners, uh, certainly for information gathering. Um, and whether, but whether or not they would require any sort of fee to do anything structured on a specific um, species, um, I have no idea. And if it were favourable, that's something that um, our democratic services and officers need, and finance people need to discuss. Thank you. I, I could actually answer that as well, because we are a essentially a department of the Somerset Wildlife Trust. So we sit within them, even though we act autonomously. Um, we are working with the Wildlife Trust to try and work out a monitoring program for the state of nature within Somerset. But even the work that they've done isn't necessarily or isn't always translatable to actually doing trend analysis and things like that. Um, so historically, it's always been presence and absence monitoring um, and trying to sort of base a condition based on what's there and what's not there. So we're trying to answer two different types of question. Um, but we are working with the Wildlife Trust already on, on that. Thank you, Liam. Um, Councillor Bartlett. Hi. Um, I was just I was going back to the question about invasive species. Um, you said that Sedgemoor uh, was still losing its natural kind of habitats, only by 4%, you said, but, you know, that's still obviously significant. Um, but you said you're losing that to urbanisation and agriculture. Do you know what's causing the um, invasive species? I don't know if you might have said, but you know, if these are rising, then um, what's causing that, do you think? Is it human sort of intervention? Helen? So yeah, some yeah, some of the species uh, will be brought in uh, by humans themselves, uh, just from uh, natural travel and things like that. But quite a lot of invasive species is from um, the quality of the habitat. So if the habitat is not right for the native species that are supposed to be growing here, um, then the quality, then they're overrun by invasive species that need different type of qual habitat quality. Um, so it's the, ma the main way to tackle the invasive species is making sure that the habitats are correct for the native species that are in the UK. Um, and then just getting a hand on um, ident identifying where they are and removing the invasive species. So is that, sorry to take up your time, but is that to do with, um, you said about humans sort of moving from space to space? I mean, so this is a human created issue or not always? Not, not always. Um, yeah. That. yeah, Leon, okay. do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, it has been human actions that have caused the um, native, uh, invasive species, things like so if we look at Crashula helmsii, which is like a, a New Zealand stonewort that's in aquatic systems, completely takes over, doesn't have the extreme weather conditions that it has in New Zealand that would normally control it. No natural predators, nothing like that. So it can completely swamp and overtake a waterway. Mm. Floating pennywort, Himalaya balsam, these are all plant species. You know, once they're in... Uh, Sorry? I've, I've frozen and I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, okay. We'll just give it a sec to, can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, yeah, I'm back in the room, yeah. Okay, so things like Crashula helmsii, they were actually introduced by humans for ponds. And then birds have actually started to carry it around. A duck might land, they only need one tiny fragment of a leaf to actually spread it. Um, we've got things like ship ballasts spreading, um, is it zebra mussels, I think is the, the invasive species. We've had signal crayfish or uh, American crayfish introduced you know, things like that, and they start to outcompete again because they've got no natural predators. They tend to be larger, more aggressive. So there's a whole range of factors, but we've kind of done the initial introduction and then these species just kind of start taking over. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any more hands up. So um, at this point, I'd like to really thank um, Leon and Ellen for bringing the report, the final report back to us um, and, and making the presentation today. Your work's been invaluable in getting us here to where we are today. So thank you very much, both of you. Thank you.
it, at that point, it's a good point really to kind of look at where we are now, our current position with this. Um, since the last meeting of, of the Community Scrutiny Advisory Committee in March, um, the Cross Party Working Group met to discuss this report on the state of nature in, Sun in Sedgemoor and to draft some potential recommendations. Um, as it's been highlighted, the report demonstrates the stark decline in ecology within Sedgemoor, um, particularly with 63% of prime terrestrial sites of special scientific interest, the so called triple SIs, being deemed in an unfavourable declining or partially destroyed condition. These are areas which are designed to be pristine habitat for wildlife and in, are in a clear and concerning decline. Um, similarly, there were four freshwater catchments monitored to be in good condition in 2011, um, but by 2019 there were now none with this rating. Um, this means that the wildlife and fisheries have been impacted by human activity. The report also demonstrates a threat from invasive species towards native species and the fine balance of habitats. As a working group, um, we came to an agreement that there is a need to act now. The report produced by the Somerset Environment Record Centre is an independent piece of research and it's of great value. It's impartial and demonstrates the immense gravity of the ecological decline in Sedgemoor. Many um, neighbouring councils have also already declared an ecological emergency. Somerset Western Taunton did so in October 2020 um, after they declared the, the climate emergency in March 2019. Um, and with the Climate Emergency Joint Consultation Panel um, now well established with Somerset Western Taunton, we can utilise this panel to not only address climate actions, but ecological actions too, maximising opportunities from combining both the climate and ecological emergencies together, alongside the joint resources we have with Somerset Western Taunton. Um, the working group put together recommendations which are outlined in Appendix B of your agenda pack, which I hope you've all been had a chance to, to read through. Um, and the, um, they'll be presented to executive and full council and hope that you will all um, feel able to support these. Um, I'm therefore proposing and I hope that everybody's happy. We have debated this topic at length, so I'm not planning to open this up to debate if possible, but I'm proposing that the Community Scrutiny Advisory Committee recommends, subject to the approval of the Executive Advisory Meeting, for the leader to take the following recommendations to full council. Um, I won't read out the introduction on the on the declaration, but for clarity, I will read out the, um, the declaration that's being proposed. So declare an ecological emergency based on the evidence provided in CERC's report on the state of nature in Sedgemoor, which demonstrates the seriousness of the ecological decline in Sedgemoor and the need to act now. Address ecological issues alongside climate emergency actions, maximising co-benefits from addressing both the climate and the ecological emergencies. Approve a joint ecological emergency vision and action plan with Somerset Western Taunton that aligns with the Somerset County Climate Emergency Strategy. Use the existing joint Sedgemoor District Council and Somerset Western Taunton consultation panel to scrutinise progress of the Ecological Action Plan against its ambitions and 2030 targets and report back to community scrutiny on a quarterly basis. Add ecological implications alongside those for climate and sustainability in committee and council reports. So that's the declaration that's been proposed, which has come from the working group. Um, I We'll ask before I ask for a seconder for this proposal if Councillor Keane would like to say anything um, as she was part of the working group and is the portfolio holder. Councillor Keane. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I've got I've got the draft document in front of me here. Um, as the Chairman has said, we have spent many hours going over this. If you recall earlier this year, we were asked by one of our uh, most senior planning strategy officers to provide evidence and we have done that and Leon's earlier charts and graphs do show in addition to the, the evidence on the, um, the the spreadsheet that is also provided that there is cause for great and long-term concern so I fully fully recommend this document I wholly support it as 
part of uh, as one of the, the people that uh, assisted in putting it together. And I would ask you all if you would consider supporting it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have two people asked to speak. Councillor Graham Goldman Pearson. Thank you, Chair, and and thank you to everyone who's presented this 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 report and to and to Janet for her intervention there. Um, I, I, assuming there are no, no amendments, I'd like to propose that we adopt the recommendation. Okay, so I I was happy to propose that. So you happy to second it? For me. <laughs> oh, you you opposed you you proposed it, did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm happy to second it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Councillor Rodriguez. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. It was only really really quick <laughs> comment. Um, just to as well as a member of the group to welcome this um report. Um, I think like you've already said, it took a long time getting here. I know some of us would have liked it to be a lot quicker. Um, but I think having that local evidence and the report on that really, as a, as a member of this group, gives me the confidence to support the recommendations, having read through that report. So just big thank you to everyone put that together. And thanks everyone for the patience as well for the time to getting here. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Much appreciated. OK, brilliant. So we have, I proposed it, Councillor Gobham Pearson seconded it. Um, is anybody against this proposal? OK, Leila, are you OK with that in terms of um, housekeeping wise? Yes, thank you, Chairman. That's uh, uh, I think that's quite clear. OK, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I expect that that recommendation will go on now to executive and on to full council. Um, dates possibly to be confirmed, but I would hope to get this through um, in July. Um, to say for me, it's it's kind of a bit of a bittersweet success we have. It has been a long journey. Um, bittersweet mainly because nobody wants to have to declare an ecological emergency. We would rather not be in this situation, but I'm extremely happy that the committee as a whole has unanimously decided that we do need to act now and put this forward. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank Leon and Ellen. Um, if you wish to stay for the rest of the meeting, you're more than welcome to, or if you need to go, feel free, that's fine. But thank you very much for your work and your contribution today. And thank you to all the officers involved in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we go on to the next item of the agenda today. Was, um, item six is the ecological action plan and vision, which kind of ties in with the previous item. Um, and let me just get this up on the agenda. So you've got the action plan and vision are in the appendices of the agenda. And today we have um, Catherine Church with us, who's going to be presenting this item first. Catherine, can I hand over to you now? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very yeah. much. Um, I didn't introduce myself when we, we did this round robin, so I'll do it properly now. So. So I'm Catherine Church. I'm a project manager in the climate change team in Somerset, Western Taunton. Um, however, I've been working on the vision and action plan uh, for uh, it's a joint project uh, with Sedgeball and Somerset, Western Taunton. So my role is funded 50-50 uh, uh, to deliver this piece of work uh, across the two district councils. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a summary about how we've got to where we, we've got to and the process, and then we'll open up for uh, discussion. Um, so you've had a, a good sort of background uh, around the declaration and, and the, the challenges we're facing um, in terms of ecology and uh, the state of nature in Sedgemoor. So this basically takes uh, the declaration and turns it into uh, tangible things that we can do uh, going forwards. Um, so like the uh, declaration, our aim is to have um, it, uh, the ecological uh, emergency vision and action plan adopted by full council on the 20th of July. So our next meeting will be with the exec uh, at exec briefing. That's the 20th of June. And we may be going to exec on the 6th of July. And that's just dependent on advice that we, we uh, get from uh, the uh, during the exec briefing. Um, just so that you're aware, we're, we're sort of balancing the, the two sort of democratic processes across the two districts. Um, 
I have presented at Scrutiny in Somerset, West and Taunton on the 25th of May, and I'll be presenting again at their exec um, on Wednesday, so that's the 13th of June. Their full council uh, will take pl place on the 7th of July. So as you can see, we're trying to sort of coordinate this so that the process is, is fluid and, and um, works well across uh, both districts. So how have we got here? Well, we've been working in collaboration, so both with members as well as colleagues across the two uh, councils. So through the Joint Climate Change Delivery Partnership, uh, which is scrutinised by the uh, Joint Consultation Panel, so Councillor Janet Keane, Hilary Bruce and Charlie Richards are part of that, and we've consulted with them. We've also consulted with a number of different uh, services across uh, the organisation, so um, inward investment, clean surrounds, environmental services, housing and community and well, well-being uh, teams So and others. So this has been a really important process because although it's, it's labelled ecological um, emergency under sort of climate change, um, it's, it's got to be delivered through throughout our organisations and and beyond, um, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. So there are two main documents which have been circulated. The first is the vision. And within that, we set out our ambitions and our targets for ecological recovery. So there are four main uh, uh, ambitions under which four or five uh, targets sit. So the first ambition is around wildlife. Um, so it's around having wildlife flourishing across our districts, particularly th within our des designated sites. We heard about Triple uh, SIs and the, sta uh, the state they are currently in, but also we're talking more widely across ecological networks as well. Secondly, assets and open spaces. So this is very much about how we manage our, our spaces and managing them in a way that will enable wildlife to thrive, but being mindful that these are also multifunctional um, places. So we need to balance that where appropriate with other functions such as amenity. Our values. So this is the third, the third uh, ambition, and this is around our decision making, our policies. So it's tying in ec ecology, the ecosystem services into our decision making. So that could be through procurement, it could be through planning, how we manage our, our open spaces. And then the fourth one is around connecting people with nature. So I've called it people and nature. So it's engaging citizens with the natural world. As we know, it's it's great for our well-being. Um, it, it brings communities together. So there's lots and lots of benefits as well as improving the, the quality of habitats and and enhancing protection for, for different species. Also, actually, one point around uh, monitoring as well, which was uh, discussed earlier in the presentation. If we can bring in um, uh, community groups to engage with monitoring, that obviously engages them in, in understanding what's around them, but also it provides data that is going to be really useful as we move forwards uh, with the uh, collaborations with the Local Nature Partnership. Um, I'll touch on that in a moment. So um, all of this is underpinned by our collaboration with others. So we can't deliver this completely on our own. I mentioned that when we're, we, we have to deliver this across uh, different teams, but we also have to work with partners as well. So the Local Nature Partnership is a, is a key um, partnership across um, many organisations with the Wildlife Trust leading on that, and that will deliver sort of strategic um, improvements across uh, the county. Um, so that's where we have a number of district councils at the moment, as well as, well as other NGOs, so uh, Natural England, uh, there are, there's NFU as well, 
Um, so that's quite a strategic piece. And then we'll, we'll be, we need to be working with local community groups, friends of groups, because they're the ones that actually deliver things on the ground. So I've talked about the vision. The action plan details how these ambitions will be achieved. It's a live document which can be adapted, certainly as we go through into unitary and where policy, policies might change. So um, it's designed so that it can be um, flexible and can be designed with sort of these more strategic ambitions and, and actions going into the detail of, of uh, localised uh, changes, local, what I would call sub projects projects. Um, so the document formalises what's already happening on the ground. I think that's um, really important to stress that we're not trying to burden our resources with more work at, at, in the, at this current time. So the Meads being an example. Um, and there are other things that are, are statutory requirements, certainly as the Environment Act comes into force and there'll be planning um, policies like the biodiversity net gain, that resource will need to be um, uh, applied to. So the second point about this is that we're bringing across nature recovery actions from the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Uh, as well as the uh, carbon neutrality climate resilience uh, document uh, from uh, Somerset West and Taunton. So this really focuses on the, the kind of wildlife aspect as opposed to the carbon and the climate resilience. It enables us to perhaps focus our, our uh, targets, ambitions slightly differently, although the two are very much interlinked. Um, this work also highlights, and I mentioned this, where new work and additional resources is required in the future. And again, that's going to be important for, for Unitary. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, certainly we'll need to focus on this with the Envi Environment Act now um, uh, moving forwards. So just to say that, um, yeah, so this is very much something that is, is spearheaded um, as the sort of first thing that, that is being seen as part of an ecological um, uh, drive forward. So um, we have demonstrated that we can do this uh, together and we hope that this can be adopted uh, across uh, the county. Certainly uh, Dixie Darch are, are the Somerset Western Taunton uh, shadow, uh, uh, sorry, portfolio holder has been in discussions with the new portfolio holder Sarah Dyke. So I think that's going to be um, really positive. She's very positive about taking this uh, through to uh, through to Unitary as well. And we've been working uh, with colleagues um, in the LGR to ensure that this is is taken form at Woods and this is under the climate and water sub working group. Um, the action plan has four is going to be delivered under four main themes. So the first is around embedding nature recovery uh, throughout our work. Working with partners, so local nature partnership, but also there will be other um, partnerships that that arise uh, to ensure that we're really connected and we're we're not working in isolation. Um, enabling citizens to connect and take action for na nature. So this can be around communications. It might be things that they're doing in the home. It might be really getting involved in their local nature um, reserve or local park, children, schools. So there's lots of activity within it or opportunity for activity within uh, this this theme and then finally there's uh, an action around or theme around the governance so how do we make sure that we can ensure we have sufficient funding to deliver what we need to there is monitoring in place and that we're 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 following the same methodology as others like the local nature partnership Ship and uh, CERC, the Wildlife Trust, and that there is a reporting system in place so that we can report pr 
progress over time. So under these three themes, we have 21 overarching uh, actions and underneath these, there are many other sort of smaller projects and sub projects. Um, it, it's a way of, sort of managing them. I'm a project manager as opposed to an ecology ecologist. So I found that having it set up like this is just easier to manage as we go forwards. So, so that's a, a quick whistle stop tour of uh, the ecological vision and action plan. Um, I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Catherine. Um, before I open up questions, um, Pete, would you just like to introduce yourself because uh, um, you may also be able to answer some of the questions. Yes, sorry, I didn't introduce you, Pete. <laughs> of course. And you've been uh, very you, helpful. Hillary. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Pete Granger. I'm the ecologist, Sedgemill District Council. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to um, uh, chip in with any answers to questions. Thank you, Pete. OK, um, go to Councillor Keane first. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question is that, Catherine, do you know if as part of the background information that uh, we had uh, in the county's uh, document for climate change, the strategy, did they compile or are they planning to compile a database of landowners and estate managers? Because without their co cooperation, none of what we would like to see can possibly happen. Because I would say most of the, the land, including that which has waterways going through it that are integral to it, are in private ownership. So um, I, I can't comment on, on the climate strategy itself, um, but what I can say is that we are working in partnership. So this is with the Local Nature Partnership, um, and that is our mechanism through which we can support um, any, any work that is outside the sort of the remit of, of local council land. So we obviously can manage our assets. There are also sort of, uh, planning uh, rules which we, we can implement. Um, so that's as much as I can answer ar around that. Um, I mean, certainly we can sort of look at this in more detail. And if we're looking at unitary, there are obviously sort of questions around how it's all going to be delivered. Um, but our, my colleagues, are, certainly Christy, is working through the uh, LGR to make sure that we're, we're able to deliver this, this piece of work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Councillor Keane, for the question. Um, Councillor Harvey? Uh, thank you. I mean, what Catherine just said actually leads quite nicely into what I was going to ask. Um, obviously, we disappear next March. We then have a, a much larger authority and it would be very easy for this sort of work to get lost in the uh, first couple of years of chaos while we sort out what the hell's going on. So my re real question was, what role do we envisage for town and parish councils in being able to deliver the, these sorts of programmes? I mean, is there a role to go further down rather than going up? And if so, have any thought been given to how it would be achieved? A really good question and I don't have the full answer I'm afraid but I but that's certainly within the action plan to make sure that we are working with town and parish councils um we as we all know it's it's a bit of a sort of gray area at the moment we're not absolutely clear how the structures will will work however we are committed to making sure that um any sort of ecological protection and enhancement it, it just has to work on the ground. So uh, we are sort of connected at a local level um, and so we need to remain so. Uh, so that was some, something that I would really want to advocate. Um, and it's it's again, it's all about that working with partners, work, making sure that we we are very clear as we go into unitary about that link from that, that you know, strategic, this is our vision to OK, but now the nuts and bolts of it has to be delivered at a local level through local groups, through the parish council, through the um, the town uh, councils. So 
Yes, I, I completely support what you're saying around this, and it's a really important issue that needs to be taken forward. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions, really. The first one, um, where Somerset, Western Taunton declared an em the emergency back in 2020, I wondered if there was any examples of the steps that they have taken to address that, that we haven't yet, having only just, we're well, not even declared our emergency yet, recommended it. I just wondered if there's any examples that we could learn from. Um, and the second one was kind of similar to um, Councillor Harvey's um, point. Because um, on the action plan, the short term, um, the short term terms um, says 2023 to 2025. And I'm also raised my concern about the overlap of the creation of the new council. And I wondered how do the districts ensure that the work is followed through during this phase and that it's not pushed back when the unitary is focused on perhaps more the operational side of things as we get closer to vesting day. I know that there's um, working groups and what have you, but I just wondered um, how that will work. And thirdly, if I may, sorry, um, is it envisaged that this action plan, this docu these documents will cover all district areas from vesting day or will it still be just Somerset, Western Taunton and um, Sedgemoor? Thank you. I wasn't quite sure about your first question, could you uh, repeat that? Because I wasn't, I didn't quite understand what you meant by what examples. If you could just explain that a little bit more. Yeah, sorry. No, only because I note that it says that the Somerset Western Taunton declared their emergency in 2020. And based on that, I, want, I wondered what Somerset Western Taunton have done to address that ecological, ecological emergency in their district that perhaps <laughs> we haven't done yet in Sedgemoor. Um, yeah, that, that was, sorry. OK, no, that's that's fine. Well, um, this is why the action plan, the vision and action plan has been created. So although there are things that are happening. So, for example, I know um, that we've had the grass management uh, work implemented within Somerset Western Taunton, but I think it's also happening in Sedgemoor as well. So there are things that have been happening anyway, but this kind of formalises it. So um, you're basically Sedgemoor is, is a declaring the emergency and also presenting how how the you know the targets the vision it's all going to happen so you're you're Sedgemoor's doing it all at once whereas it's taken a bit of time for Somerset Western Taunton to declare their emer the emergency and then to have the action plan uh, put together um, so yes I I was uh, recruited back in October so I, I've I've just basically in the last six months pulled this together. So it's about, about resourcing this as well. Um, so the, the second point around making sure that we continue delivery. Now, the key thing here is that being very mindful about unitary, we've looked at what resource we have and what we've already committed to it over the next year. So that's the immediate actions. So we are confident we have the resource to deliver the immediate actions um, in terms of after that we will continue the plan is to continue to do that obviously it's, it's subject to how we are structured what are what are um i i can say is that the amount of work doesn't change it's just the structures of how how it will be delivered um, so we will still need to, you know, we all we have commitments to plant trees. We have commitments to uh, manage our grasses, etc. Um, so that work still needs to be done at a, a you know, a, 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 uh, on the ground. Um, the structures, though, are something that. It, obviously we can't manage it at this stage and, and can't I, yeah I can't really comment on but it's the fact that we are you know talking through the uh, LGR uh, there is an ecological or nature recovery uh, sort of working group so that that's working with uh, Mendip as well as um, South uh, Somerset 
uh, council. So we are already collaborating across the district councils. Um, and I can't remember your uh, the, the third point. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. It's my fault for asking too many. The last one was just um, will this um, will the document, the action plan, cover all districts oh, from? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Would you, like me to, would you like me to speak, Catherine? Yeah, if so, you want to, Christy, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry to butt in. I thought I'd just help out. Um, just to answer your kind of both your um second and third questions, Council Rodriguez. Um, so the LGR work stream I'm I'm involved in, and obviously this work forms part of our products. So it's very much all part and parcel of our um climate work um which obviously has a very high high kind of profile i guess as we move through into the new unit tree so i'm confident that from an lgr perspective moving through into unit tree this um this is very much in the forefront and um and has 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 eyes on it and so in answer to the second question i think um catherine already mentioned that um the new um forgive me if i get the phrases wrong but the new portfolio holder and the assistant portfolio holder are, are very keen and have this um, in their sights to to take through to the new council um, and we set a very strong example this is a very good foundation um, for what that could look like in terms of a strategy moving forward we've done all that thinking um, Catherine's produced a, a vision and an action plan that sets a really strong example of how this could look going through into the new um, structure with all the district councils involved. So, um, so I, uh, yeah, I see it very much as being part of our work going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christy and Catherine, for those responses. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any more hands up. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions myself on this. If that's OK. Um, I can find my questions. Um, so on um, on on the targets, um, I'm a big fan of smart goals, something that's measurable, and um, they do seem to be a little bit difficult to measure. Um, I know really important. You said earlier that this is a live document, and I note that. Further down, there's an action nine team which is developing methodology um, to monitor your progress towards ambitions. But I wonder whether those targets might become a little bit more measurable as you go forward, or are they designed to stay more strategic? I wonder how you're going to measure whether you've achieved those ambitions. It's a really good question, and we we did debate it um, extensively. Uh, it's, I think, th there is the challenge of of measurement for some of these um, or m most of them. So it's it's in a way having having very sm you know smart objectives means that you're really having to know what your baseline is and you need to have a really clear methodology to be able to say yes, that's exactly um, you know for example we have one smart uh objective so that's one in four people take action or citizens take action for wildlife so that's taken from uh, uh the uh Somerset wildlife trust we're aligning with them however that there is that challenge of how do you measure that and it can be quite complex so even the Somerset wildlife trust are aren't absolutely clear on how they'll they'll achieve be able to do that and so a lot of it is about attributing um, uh, certain sort of, uh, activities towards a, a, a an objective. So there's also the point about chasing a target rather than getting getting stuff done. So we just have to be sort of balanced about what's what's important here. These are you know a point you know these direct us to to uh, 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 let's say a loose target a loose ambition but it's not the be all and end all it's around making sure that we are continually sort of delivering on various projects to to ensure that we do deliver these pieces uh, these targets but certainly we could look at that if we think that uh, and certainly that piece of work going forwards if we think well actually we've got lots of data here it would be really easy 
to turn this into something that's smart. I think I'm nervous about putting putting numbers to a target if we're not clear about how we're actually going to measure it. No, I, I completely get that and it's possibly a bit early and like I said I can I can understand that that might be something to come in the future yeah um, but yeah. that would be a nice to see for me to have something that like I said like I agree baselines are you know difficult at the moment if non-existent so um, once you've got baselines you've got something to measure against yeah. um, in the future that would be a nice to have yeah definitely. Definitely. okay um, and then on action 14, just I'm going to get into specific just on a couple of points, if that's OK. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it says, um, you know, I just wanted to know action 14, how would that work? So if a new group, for example, is interested in, in becoming established to support wildlife, mm -hmm. who do they approach? And, and could there be some pilot schemes for this kind of thing? Yes. Uh that sounds like a great idea. So um, working with the Wildlife Trust, I know they're putting together um, guidance for local communities who want to pull together a, a Friends of group. So they're actually putting that together right now. So that would be a, a first start to get some guidance to help uh, communities. And then it's I would think it's our role to support that and to ensure that happens. So um, going back to Somerset Western Taunton, they have local nature reserves. They don't all have all these sites don't have um, friends of groups. So it's about working with um, engagement officers. And I'm not sure who the engagement officers are in Sedgemoor, but they have that sort of direct contact with communities and developing possibly friends of groups uh, where necessarily Pete I know you're working directly with groups so I don't know whether you want to add anything to that yes I, I think that's certainly one of the ways um, forward and, and of course we've got the environment champions um, group um, here in Sedgemoor um, that Anna has set up um, so those are uh, th there are certainly um, current um, uh, structures in place that we can guide people to um, if they're interested. Um, and of course, there are you know those officers like myself um, who can give um, people individual um, support and encouragement um, if they're just doing projects um, that they don't kind of um, think of as you know maybe some big enough project to have a friends of group or something um, but they just want to achieve some um, small actions in their local community um, so um, you know it's um, very much a case of contact your local ecologist and they can direct you you might get an avalanche of emails now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking really that if we're coming, you know, we're going with this and it's going to go to full council, there might be a bit of publicity around it and you may get a lot of communities going, oh, that's really interesting. I'd love to do that. What do I do? And ward members right. are going to get lots of questions. So I really yeah. just a plea if you can get some guidance out to ward members as to how to direct these requests if they come through, that would be really useful. OK. Um, and one last question before I pass to you, Councillor Harvey, if that, uh, unless it was on this point that you wanted to come back, Councillor Harvey. Yes, it was just on this point. Uh, yeah. I know we have environmental champions, uh, but members don't know who they are. Uh, so it would be useful to know if we actually had any environmental champions in our own areas uh, so that we could then make contact with them or else in fact point our parish and town councils towards them as being people who are already involved in the process. Yeah, the um, uh, Environmental Champions Group is, is Sedgemore based, um, so it's in the whole area. Um, and um, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't currently um, broken up into smaller areas than that. Um, but um, hopefully at some stage it will get kind of a bit more closer on the ground. Um, and, um, you know, we'll be able to provide the advice um, and support to encourage people uh, to um, be able to actively um, do stuff in their local area. Thank you. OK, and one one last point um, on Action 17. Um, 
I think it's really important that it, you work with housing providers as well, not just tenants. Um, we're looking at even, you know, housing associations, homes in Sedgemoor even, their definition of a tidy garden might not fit the wilded lawn. Mm -hmm. um, and tenants can't do that if their leases don't allow them to. So it, it's about working with the housing providers and landlords as well, not just with the tenants for me. Yeah, I, I think we're um, kind of pushing at an open door from that point of view. Um, I have had a um, project working with um, homes in Sedgemoor for the last three or four years now, um, where we are getting, or where homes in Sedgemoor are, are actually putting um, multi-use bird boxes um, onto um, houses where um, old roofs for, have had um, bird um, habitat, nesting habitat in them have been um, renewed. Um, so to um, recover that habitat, uh, they, they've been uh, putting bird boxes in. Um, and I, I think they've, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what the figure is at the moment, um, but it, it's certainly the uh, many dozens they've put up already, um, particularly in the um, uh, Sydenham estate. Um, but it, it's certainly a project that we'd like to expand um, across the district. Okay, thank you. Pete, I, I actually spoke to your colleague um, just uh, on Friday and he said there were around 100 bird boxes that had been, mm. so, uh, right. had yeah. been uh, put in place. So that's really good news. Yeah, yeah that that's is, fantastic. That is good news. The, the only thing I'd add to that is I've been on a, on a walkabout and my colleague has recently with Homes and Sedgemoor um, and they're, they're quite keen on getting people to cut their lawns. So <laughs> <laughs> might not be the best. Yeah. So. We'll, we'll, we'll work on them for next uh, no <laughs> more May. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, any more questions from anyone? Can't see any hands up. So at this point, I would like to Really thank you, Catherine, for an excellent piece of work presenting that with us today. Really interesting and great to see things moving and, and like I said, tying it in together with the previous item. Um, it, it's really wonderful to see. So pleased that it's a live document and that we'll keep working and developing as we change and develop ourselves. Um, so thank you very much. I think at this point, um, if the committee are OK, I think all we need to do at this stage is to note the report. Um, and I'd like the committee to support the ecological action plan and vision um, and support these as part of the council's wider climate and ecological emergency um, aspirations if the committee's in agreement. Can't see any objections, so um, I will consider this item closed. Thank you, Catherine and Pete. I believe Sue Tomlinson was on the call as well, um, but uh, thank you very much all for your work on this. And Christy, thank you. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, everyone. Bye. OK, and um, we're going to move on now to item seven. Um, and this is the Climate Emergency Joint Consultation Panel quarterly update. Uh, and I'm going to um, hand over to Christy Blackwell. Um, you have already the highlight report, which has been circulated as an appendix in your agenda pack. Christy, thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, councillors. And hopefully Sue is still on the call with us. Um, because Sue actually is integral to some of the work that um, I'm going to be mentioning this afternoon. Um, so really, this kind of wraps up all of the discussion we've had um, this afternoon and brings in ecological emergency into our um, climate emergency work as well. Um, so just to give you a bit of history, you'll recall um, probably around eight months ago now, we entered into a partnership with Somerset West and Taunton, which has been mentioned a lot this afternoon. Um, and that involved us um, joining forces with them, pooling our resources um, and really getting the most out of uh, both of our council teams in terms of uh, delivering on our climate ambitions through our action plans. Um, Catherine was one of the officers, obviously she mentioned that, that, was, um, that joined us as part of that team. So once we formed as a partnership, we set up a governance structure and that involved um, creating a joint consultation panel, which, as you'll know, has um, three members on it, two of which are here with us today. So we have um, Councillor Janet Keane as the portfolio holder for climate emergency, Councillor Hilary Bruce and Councillor Charlie Riches, who are representing Sedgemoor District Council on that 
panel, there are three members also represented for Somerset, West and Taunton as well. And myself and my colleague Sue, who manages the team at, at um, Somerset, West and Taunton, attend those meetings. They're held quarterly and we've had three to date. Um, the first one was very much around sort of building ourselves as a group, introductions, terms of reference and those sorts of things. Um, the second one, which sort of followed in January this year, started to build some structure around what we were going to report into the meeting. Um, and the third meeting that we had, which was as recent as um, April this year, um, we produced the document which, been sh which has been shared with you in the um, agenda pack, which is a highlight report. And the highlight report is actually presented on a Excel spreadsheet to the consultation panel. So it reads slightly differently than, than you can see in front of you today. So I think you're missing some of the headings out of the um, document. But in essence, what this highlight report captures is the activity in both the both councils action plans that isn't being delivered by other officers across the council. So our actual, if you were to look at it, I'm going to just take um, Sedgemore because it's, it's easier, but if you were to look at our climate action plan, um, there are numerous actions on there um, and it, it, it will be delivered or the, the activity will be delivered by a number of my colleagues across the council. What we've captured on this highlight report is the activity that's being delivered purely by the officers within the um, climate change partnership. So please don't see this as a representation of all of the work that the council is doing in terms of uh, climate and ecological emergency. What we've tried to do in this um, particular document is just separate out what's being delivered in Somerset, West and Taunton and what's being delivered in, in Sedgemoor because there are slight differences. Um, however, there are an awful lot of um, projects which are going on across the, the two authorities um, in collaboration. Um, I should also point out that this is very much a live document um, and as you'll know, certainly for the Sedgemoor um, district, we have a business as usual structure in place, which is about managing our resources and ensuring that we can deliver on some of our project activity as we move towards unitary. Um, so the, the aspirations that are in our highlight report are, are very much that and could be subject to change um, as we move ever closer to to um to the unitary but um at the moment or as of as of april this was the activity that that we are delivering against what i'm not proposing to do this afternoon um is to run line through, line by line through the highlight report um obviously if there's any burning questions i'm happy to to see whether potentially sue or i might be able to answer them for you today but what i'd like to suggest is this is going to be a document that will come to scrutiny every quarter. Um, and should you have any questions or matters arising from the information in the highlight report, please do get in touch with, um, with the three members I mentioned before so that they can bring those issues back into that um, consultation panel forum so that we can um, adjust our work going forward if necessary. Uh, Chairman, that was all I was planning to say on that. So um, um, back to you. That's great, Christy. Thank you, because I'm aware that we've, you know, the, the meeting's quite a lengthy one already. So that, I think that's perfect. Um, so just to remind members, so it's myself, Charlie Richards and um, Janet Keane. Um, if you wish to ask any questions on the highlight report, um, I'd also say if you need any other information, if you need it in a different format, if something's missing, feed that kind of information back as well please because that gives you a format that's more user friendly or you know if you, if you need something else to to interpret it then, then please say so. Councillor Rodriguez. Uh, th thank you Chairman. Um, I have nothing to add. Uh, Christie's report and, and Catherine's background knowledge are very comprehensive and I entirely support them both. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't going to ask a question because you know, I know Christy doesn't want any, um, but as you're here, I thought I'd take the opportunity <laughs> just, to ask you two, just to ask you two. Um, on one thing that, um, on, on the tree planting, because um, I think that was quite successful, um, I'm assuming there is, and I should know this, but I'm assuming that there's a budget 
for tree planting to continue this next year or this year that we're in. And I just wondered if you know, not the figure, I'm not asking you the figure, but do you know if it's going to be more or less the same or are we going to be a bit more ambitious with it this year? And also, I asked at a previous meeting, I don't remember when, whether some sort of mapping exercise could be done about uh, as to see where whereabouts those trees were planted, because um, I know that the town, Bridgewater Town Council also done their own um, tree planting and whether or not that, that could be done. Um, and the other one, but I think you've kind of covered it in the answer you gave me previously, was on 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 this um, document you've got um there's no head up so i'm assuming delivery oh. completed feasibility that section so where it says feasibility um again i'm just wondering about the unitary um, side of things and whether where it says feasibility is that going to be completed or a visit to be completed before vesting day and again the overlap um question is around around that really yeah that's fine. So just taking that last point first, I think, um, yeah, you picked up where, where I was referring to the fact that there is um, potentially um, the opportunity for us to, to perhaps not deliver on quite so much as, as we'd originally planned to. Um, looking at the, I've, I've just scrolled down, and the very first one that I can come across that says feasibility is the retrofit waterless urinals. I'm not sure if there are more after that. Um, but certainly the work that the officer Jane Healy did for us um, was around scoping which public toilets we had in, in Sedgemoor that, that could benefit from um, being transferred to a waterless urinals. That piece of work, that feasibility piece of work is complete. Um, now there's a, a debate around whether um, there is now the resources to be able to deliver on that prior to unit three. So that's the type of issue that will be going back into the BAU group, the BAU task group, um, to consider whether we can deliver on that. But certain, certainly the piece of work that's been done to date, even if it's not delivered by March 2023, will still be a valid document that will go through into the new unitary structure in terms of our assets. Um, going back to the um, tree fund, um, so this year, instead of having, um, because we found that um, we were offering um, funds for parishes and town councils to uh, bid to have some trees, um, we didn't necessarily spend all that fund straight away. There, um, there wasn't as much take up or demand as we thought there was going to be, although after a second round, um, a lot more did go. Um, what we've done this year um, in terms of our budget is we're contributing to um, the development of the Somerset Tree Strategy, which very much does that piece of mapping work. And I've seen um, I've seen a presentation by I apologise I can't remember the organisation that's part of our partnership deliver on delivering on that, but it's a very interesting um, document which is far more clever than I am in terms of it, it maps things and it does it sort of as you look at it and sort of a bird's eye view in terms of um, coverage right across Somerset and where we might have opportunity um, for potential um, tree, large scale tree planting opportunities in the future. So that what we're contributing to um, in terms of our funding this year is the creation of um, a tree strategy that again will take us through into a new council in terms of what needs to be our focus, whether that is purchasing land to, to plant on or whether it is using existing land that's available through the local authority to, to plant. So you won't see the uh, a repeat of last year's um, opportunity for parish and town councils to have uh, free trees in the same way that we've done in the previous couple of years. Thanks, Christy. Is there any chance you might be able to send some information about that Somerset Tree Strategy out to members? Certainly. Yep. I'll um yep, I'll see what I can pull together for you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Um I think uh all we need to do at this point is is note the update um and uh welcome a, another quarterly update in September. Um presumably we'll get a highlight report prior to the meeting again, um, which will be after the next um, panel meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Christy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, moving on now to item eight. 
Um, I believe we have uh, Dave Coles with us. Um, Dave, are you here? Hello, yes, I'm here. All right, so this item is the um, about the animal welfare officer or dog wardens. Um, let me just go on and yeah, so I'll, I'll just simply hand over to you, Dave, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. What, I'll, what I'm going to do is um, just share my screen. So I haven't got a PowerPoint presentation thing today, but I have uh, I was given a sort of uh, list of sort of the types of information that you might want. So I've done some notes in there, which I'll, I'll put on the screen just so I can see them as I go through them. And obviously you can see them as I as I go through those. So I'll just share my screen. It came and went. Yeah, we've got a slight. Oh, there it is. There. No, that's okay. Can everyone see that? Not coming through yet. Mine's a bit slow. Oh, here it is. Yeah. There it is. Could we make it a bit larger? Yeah. Um, let me just. Is that better? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. So, so what I'm going to do is just run through the information briefly. Um, I don't know whether you guys got this information, the, the sort of cover points here um, before the meeting, um, but I'll just run through through most of it now. Now, now the, if I start with the uh, what, what the dog warden service covers, it's a wide ranging service, so um, covers quite a few areas of responsibility and I'll just move down to the bullet points here. So um, we have one, only only have one dog warden now. Um, up until a couple of years ago, we used to have two dog wardens, so we had a lot more capacity to deliver more bits and pieces. So currently, we only have one dog warden, um, and the service, like I say, is quite a broad service in terms of the types of things it covers. Although obviously dog and, and animal related, so probably the first thing to to talk about is the stray dog service. So um, we deal with all the dog warden deals with stray dogs. So uh, people obviously call the council and say that they've either seen a dog or they may have picked up a dog um, and uh, we have a legal duty to to respond to that. A, a few years ago, well quite a long time ago now, it used to be dealt with by the police but that came over to us, I don't know, probably 10, 15 years ago now. Um, so we deal with all the stray dogs within the district. If someone rings up, we have a performance indicator that we will pick that up um, within within that day, if at all possible. Um, so we will we will we will pick that dog up, uh, and the dog warden will go out, seize the dog, and it will be taken to kennels. So we've got a legal duty to do that, um, and we get we do get a lot of complaints about stray dogs or reports of stray dogs. Not all of them, when the dog warden gets out there, will necessarily still be there when they get there. Uh, obviously, the ones that have been picked up by people will be. Uh, and the dog warden will go there, take them. Uh, she scans them for microchips to see whether they are, whether they're chipped. And if it is, if it's a local person, then she'll try and make contact with them before she takes it to kennels and see if she can return the dog to them before it going to kennels. If it's not chipped or there's no, you know, she can't get any response from the owner, then the dog is taken to our kenneling contractor. And that contractor is White House Kennels. Excuse me. White House Kennels in uh, sort of Limsham Way, so they're taken up there. And then we have a duty then to uh, obviously house those dogs in the kennels for, for seven days, uh, in which time we do try and make contact and see if we can you know, establish who the owner is. Uh, and uh, obviously if the owner comes forward, then the dog will be uh, handed back to them. Uh, there is a fee, they obviously have to pay the fees of collection and the, and the kenneling fees for that. Uh, if there is no owner, then the dog, on the eighth day, so to make sure, you know, on the seventh, on the eighth day, the dog is then signed over to the kennels and the kennels will then um, rehome that dog. So Sedgemoor op operates a, a sort of no euthanasia policy, so the dogs are all rehomed if they're suitable. I mean, it's very, very, very occasionally we might get a dog which has been picked up, uh, which is extremely aggressive, you know, quite, you know, quite dangerous. Um, and in those circumstances, some, you know, very, very occasionally, I mean, probably one or two a year, 
may have to not be rehomed in the fact that it would be potentially too dangerous to rehome those dogs um, with, you know, in a, in a domestic environment. Um, so that's a stray dog service. We operate an hour hours stray dog service as well, and that's covered by our contractor, our kenneling contractor. So on the weekends, people can call in if they do have a stray dog or a dog's, you know, a dog's been found or seen straying, and the contractor will go out and do this, a similar thing to the dog warden does. Um, and we'll take it back to the kennels and we'll try the process of, of trying to identify who owns them. So that's the stray dogs. Um, in 2021, I'm trying to look here. We had about 100 stray dogs. Um, like I say, not all of those go to kennels, um, but obviously there is a proportion of those that do. Um, and we also get informed about people who've lost their dogs. So people, you know, people do lose their dogs. Um, and obviously it's trying to put two and two together. You know, if, if someone's lost a dog and we've picked up a stray, that's part of the process of trying to, to reunite the dogs with their owners. Um, so the next thing that the dog warden does is they do undertake patrols across the district. So they go into sort of places like parks and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, if people are taking their dogs into areas they shouldn't be, then they'll intervene in those sort of situations. They'll look at things like dog fouling. So we can issue fixed penalty notices for dog fouling if we catch people doing it. So there's quite a bit of patrolling that goes on. Um, they're also included in things like animal uh, or undertake work to do with animal welfare. So the animal welfare side, um, I can talk about a little bit more in detail later on because that was part of the, the information that specifically was, was requested. So I've got a little bit of information further on on animal welfare. Um, assisting the police and RSPCA. So there's quite a lot of partnership working, I would say, with the dog warden service. So because uh, the police have some powers to do with dogs, particularly with dangerous dogs and things like that. Um, and the dog warden does work with them in certain circumstances as well as, uh, you know, potentially dangerous dogs um, give advice or assist them in, in dealing with them. Uh, and similarly with the RSPCA, uh, there's a quite a lot of joint work with the RSPCA on animal welfare issues. Um, the dog warden's got very good uh, contacts with the various inspectors that work in our area, so there will be, you know, joint working on those sorts of things. Uh, dog control and fouling, we sort of covered that in the patrol section. So. Like I said earlier, they will they will sort of deal with issues of you know people's dogs not being in control and, and fouling issues. Dangerous dogs, uh, they get involved with that. So in terms of dangerous dogs, um, there's there's two elements to that. Um, the really serious thing, so dog attacks on people, uh, where people have been uh, attacked by a dog, and you know they're quite serious ones. Those are generally dealt with by the police under their powers under the dangerous dogs legislation. Um, and we would all the dog warden would generally deal with sort of less serious things. So, you know, people's dogs getting a bit um, carried away in parks and, you know, you know, chasing people and things like that. Or or if there is dog on uh, dog on dog attacks or uh, dogs attack other animals, they would get more involved with those sorts of things. Um, and they've got various various things that they can do. So some of it might be, you know, if, if, if it's just a. Uh, uh, a low level issue i had someone someone's letting their dog run around and it's it's not doing what it should be then it you know it would start off with informal advice as it escalates we can serve things like uh get them to you know uh sign something called an undertaking which requires them to keep their dog under control in public places or you know if it's uh if it's attacked something they can require it to you know have a have say a muzzle or something like that on it uh, and then if if it progresses past that, that's when we would probably involve the police and, and get involved with using their enforcement powers. If, you know, if the behaviour has deteriorated to a point that it's it's posing risk to the public. Um, most of the undertakings we would serve, people tend to tend to take notice of those and deal with the, with the behaviour. And the dog warden, like I say, is, is very experienced in dog handling and, um, you know, well, all aspects of dog care and uh, dog behaviour and stuff and can give people, you know, that, that first informal advice can be quite useful in terms of giving people uh, an idea of how they can deal with the dog's behaviour because, you know, a lot of people sometimes buy dogs and they don't necessarily understand why the dog is behaving in a certain way. So it can be quite useful for the dog warden to, to give advice on those sorts of things. Um, animal licensing. So I'll cover that again in a bit more detail later because there was a specific question or line of inquiry about animal licensing. So I'll go into more detail on that. 
Um, and some of the other stuff is just general advice. You know, get a lot of calls and complaints, well, not complaints, but calls about sort of dog behaviour and rehoming and education and so forth. And you know, that can that is part of the job is educating people and you know trying to help them with their you know the behaviour problems they might be having their dog or just general advice. We're getting quite a lot, or we always have had quite a lot of people ringing up about rehoming dogs. Obviously, Sedgemoor doesn't rehome dogs. We'll deal with stray dogs, but we won't take people's dogs in if they if they no longer want them. Um, but the dog will give advice on charities, etc., and what can be done in terms of you know who to contact if they do need to have their dog rehomed. And and one of the other things they do is we get as a service, as a wider service, so. The wider part of my team would deal with uh, environment, you know, traditional environmental health stuff to do with noise complaints and so forth. And we do get a, a huge number of complaints about dog barking. So the dog warden, uh, the environment health office will, will be involved in sort of progressing the case, but the dog warden can become involved on, you know, on quite a few occasions in, in giving advice to people who've got a dog that might be barking to try and help resolve the problem before it becomes a sort of more of a a formal situation where we might have to take um, formal legal action. So again, that advice and guidance that they can give um, to people on, you know, in relation to separation anxiety that can cause dogs to bark or, or, or whatever the issue is, that can be really useful in trying to resolve some of the some of the dog bark complaints that we get. So that's a bit of an overview of the um, of the functions that they provide. Um, if I just move on a little bit further down now, so we've covered stray dogs and dangerous dogs. Uh, we mentioned earlier about the police. Again, they have powers. A lot of their powers are to deal with, you know, they don't do anything to do with strays and so forth. It is all really to do with sort of dangerous dogs and uh, dogs that maybe have bitten people and so forth. Or like it says there, dogs being used for legal purposes, dog fighting or um, you know poaching and so forth. So. The police have some overlap powers, but uh, we tend to work well with the police in, in trying to resolve some of these issues. So the next question on the uh, information that I was requested was about legislation that we use. Um, so I've sort of listed some of it here. Um, a lot of the stuff to do with uh, stray dogs and so forth is under the Environmental Protection Act and regulations that are made under that relate and those regulations generally relate to things like fees and charges we can we can uh, charge for you know if we seize dogs what we can charge people if they if they claim them uh, and there's obviously regulations that specify how long we have to keep a dog uh, before we can rehome it uh, once we've seized it. Uh, the Animal Welfare Act that covers uh, well, like it says, things to do with animal welfare. So there are some uh, some powers, etc., that we have in terms of investigating animal welfare complaints and so forth. Um, we do get quite a lot of um, well, a lot of the dog barking complaints sometimes start off as animal welfare issues. In that, you know, people ring up and say that you know there's a dog barking. We think there's there's an issue with you know with animal welfare. Dog warden will probably visit, and um, it won't necessarily be a welfare issue. It's just you know, it turns more into a noise complaint, which would be dealt with as, as, as a noise complaint rather than a welfare issue. Um, there's various dangerous dogs legislation that we uh, that, that powers out there, some of them enforced by the police, some of them that powers that we have. So things like the Dangerous Dogs Act, um, 1991, uh, things to do with the Dogs Act, 1871. That's a that's a, a very old piece of legislation, but there's still powers available to to um, enforcing authorities to use that. So there's various pieces of legislation for dangerous dogs. Um, the other thing that we've got is the Anti-Social Social Behaviour Crime and Policing Act, and that introduced uh, something called public space protection orders. Uh, and that's how we enforce things like dog fouling or, or an, an issue sort of um, areas where dogs aren't allowed to be taken. So things like children's play parks, um, they're all covered by uh, public space protection orders. So people shouldn't be taking dogs into children's play areas where there's play equipment and so forth. And that gives us the power to deal with things like dog fouling. So uh, um, those are made locally by the council um, under the Act. So we we have to renew them every three years uh, and when we go to renew them we always do a consultation so because obviously there's new development that gets taken place 
uh, and then we can include things like new public public open spaces and play areas and so forth or if say a parish council has an area where they've had a particular problem then we can include that uh, within within the new orders when we review them every three years so um, so that that's part of the legislation for the sort of general dog warden work in terms of licensing because this was uh, something that's come up so there's various legislation for uh, licensing of um, establishments where where animals are kept or dogs are breeding and so forth so the main piece of legislation for that is the animal welfare licensing of activities involving animals regulations uh, and that came in in 2018 and that replaced a, a raft of previous legislation so these are it's like with a lot of things with legislation and say environmental health and well a lot of areas where there's legislation over the years new pieces of um legislation come in and new regulations come in and you know it's covering different things as, as things change and you end up with like we do with a lot of things you know numerous pieces of legislation that um, cover various things so these regulations that came in in 2018 look to consolidate all these pieces of legislation within one act or one set of regulations uh, and it also updated some of those areas of uh, regulation so there's more um, there's they're, they're slightly more onerous than they were previously but I will talk a little bit more about that in the section on animal welfare so these are the main pieces of legislation this piece here and this and that replaced the various pieces that I've highlighted down here so these are no longer um, standalone pieces of legislation they've effectively been incorporated within those regulations there's two other sets of regulations for the licensing, so Dangerous Wild Animals Act, and that covers things like, um, I suppose, venomous snakes. Um, if someone wants to keep something like a crocodile or something like something which is, you know, which is a bit more, uh, I suppose, exotic and a bit dangerous. So uh, there's, uh, there's that sort of um, legislation there that requires certain licenses and inspections and controls to be in place obviously to protect the public from from sort of animals that are um, a bit more dangerous than, than normal. And then there's the Zoo Licensing Act, which does what it says, covers things like zoos. Now, zoos aren't necessarily sort of going to Bristol Zoo or London Zoo. They can be things like um, these sort of animal parks where um, not necessarily lions and tigers, but there are different you know certain types of animals that would be covered if you've got certain collections of animals that would require a zoo like a zoo license so that's just a whistle stop through to or through the legislation um, in terms of complaint figures this was the um, other inquiry that, that, that I was asked to cover so in terms of SRUs so SRUs are service requests um they get or the dog warden gets about five to six hundred a year which come through directly sort of via the dog warden service uh, and that will be anything from uh sort of you know just general advice on dogs a lot of it's going to be things to do with dangerous dogs we get a lot of dangerous dogs issues um things to do with animal welfare so a whole raft of of, of sius come in um, some of them will be easy to deal with, you know, may just be a phone call, but there'll be a high percentage of those that require visits, maybe multiple visits and, uh, you know, various communications to be sent to resolve the problem. In terms of licensed premises, uh, we've got about, um, I've spelled premises wrong there, I don't know if I've done that. Um, we have got uh, approximately 50 licensed premises at the moment for um, for animal issues and um, they uh, they are administered initially by the licensing team so they do all the administration for it and the dog warden will do the the various technical points of uh, undertaking the the sort of routine inspections and processing the applications and making sure that the relevant controls are in place we also outside of the uh, licensed premises also have licensing inquiries so people ringing up concerned about uh, things to do with you know illegal people operating without licenses or allegedly operating without licenses a lot of stuff to do with dog breeding people 
you know, not having the correct licenses to breed dogs, and the dog one will investigate those. And if they need a license, then you know, relevant action will be taken by the licensing section. And as I said earlier, things like patrols uh, to do with sort of, you know, dog control issues. Uh, complaints handling. So we've got uh, so as with all the environment health stuff, members of the public can make contact uh, via the website. So we've got uh, online forms and we had those for quite a few years now. So people can people can access it via online forms. They can use the phone or they can email us. So we've, we've got a variety of of ways that people can make contact with us. Um, and that's pretty useful. I mean, I, I mean, it's probably quite obvious for me to say this, but obviously before things like the web forms came out, you know, people could only really contact or would only really contact you more in office hours. But now obviously the web forms are there. It allows people to make contact, you know, anytime they want. So and that's that's really good for the customer because obviously not all these things happen straight away and it can be fresh in their mind and they can, you know, submit a web form if it's sort of Sunday afternoon or something and get that information over to us so we can start looking at it. Once a um, complaint or service request comes in, it's then allocated uh, to an officer. Obviously, with the dog warden service, it, it, we only have one dog warden, so it's now only allocated to one officer. Uh, stuff that's not obviously dog warden related, if it's if it's say a, a dog barking incident, that would be allocated to environment health officer, who would then liaise with the dog warden if the specialist advice is needed. And then a dog warden will will make contact with the customer. So they'll they'll ring the customer if it's via email and there's no telephone contact, they'll email them. And then that's when the investigation starts or, you know, or the process of, of looking into what the issue is. Uh, and that would involve, you know, contacting um, contact the customer, undertaking visits to the air if necessary. If there's an allegation against uh, another individual, then obviously going to speak to that individual. And trying to, you know, trying to find resolution to to whatever the problem is. So that's how we deal with. Uh, that's the sort of a general gist of sort of complaints and complaint handling or service requests. Um, in terms of educating the public, this was another line of inquiry which I was asked to have a look at. Um, we do less of the sort of formal education these days because only because obviously the the services has reduced in size and resource. Uh, we used to do microchipping events, uh, they used to do school talks and so forth, but with only one dog warden now, it's not possible to do these more formal things. And also some of the things like the school talks, even when we were doing them, what with the uh, demands on the national curriculum, stuff like that, it, sometimes it was very difficult to get, um, the, you know, for the school to have actually time for, to, to do some of this stuff. So. So we, as we've got reduced resources, we tend to do different sorts of education. So the education is really more now in terms of our interactions with members of the public. So it would be, like I say, rather than doing a, a, a say a microchipping campaign, we will obviously we can speak to members of the public if they inquire about things, um, or if you know, or if the dog warden's out and about, they get a lot of, or, or the dog warden gets a lot of um, people coming up to them, obviously while they're out patrolling asking them questions for advice and so forth. So a lot of the education stuff we do now is is just really um, ad hoc as and when we're requested for information and so forth. And again, a lot of the work they do is to do with the noise complaints, working with the Environment Health Office is also education because again, like I said earlier, people buy dogs and you know that is quite complicated sometimes if they provide if they're demonstrating certain types of behaviours and uh, giving that advice on on how they might be able to to help prevent it from barking or whatever the whatever the problem they're having with the dog can be quite useful um, and can obviously prevent a, a, a situation from escalating into a more formal situation. Um, so the education side, uh, who deals with animal cruelty or animal welfare concerns? So that was another line of inquiry. So. There's two strands to that, really. So the licensing side of things, a lot of the inspections and so forth, it's obviously to regulate what they're doing, uh, to make sure that what they're doing is, is obviously safe for members of the public or, or however they're doing it. But it's also the animal welfare side of things, making sure that um, that anyone who's got a license for for um, for sort of animals is you know it's got the relevant welfare facilities in place for those animals so um 
so it's sort of split role really because the licensing team do some of the regulation um you know they'll do some of the paperwork side of things and get things set up and actually issue the license whereas uh, tina the dog warden you know goes out she will review applications that come in and she goes and does the routine uh annual inspections of all these premises uh, and they can be quite time consuming in that you have to go around and, and check all you know everything that they're doing all the paperwork and, uh, and meet them on site and check their you know their facilities that they've got for the various animals um we um that are licensed so we've got things like dog breeders they're licensed they require a license to be inspected kennels and catteries they're all licensed and inspected pet shops uh riding establishments and home borders uh, and obviously things like where they you know people have got these collections of of sort of dangerous wild animals uh, and like I say to do with, and things to do with zoos so there's quite a lot of work involved in that and it's quite a technical it's quite a technical thing because obviously not all the things you know say a pet shop that might have reptiles and stuff like that is going to be different from a from a dog breeder um, and also a, a lot of things that have come in recently so and this is one of the things they've included in the new legislation is that they you know things like um they call it doggy daycare so it's a bit like if you've got children you take your dog to a uh you know you take your child to a nursery it's a bit like nursery for dogs so you go to work and you drop it off and they look after in the day there's no there's no board in there they can't keep them overnight and so forth and there's quite a few of those have obviously popped up over the years with more people owning dogs and more people working so so looking at those and making sure that you know if they need a license that they're licensed and what they're doing again like with everything is is that the animal welfare side is is dealt with uh general animal welfare so like i said earlier the dog warden's got some powers under some of the animal welfare legislation a lot of this will be um there'll be a joint approach with the rspca so um dog warden say for example gets a complaint uh, or a service request about uh, an animal welfare concern you know they'll make contact with the client establish what it is and then they'll go out and visit and uh, you know and, and investigate and see whether they you know what the issue is and and they can assess it and determine whether it they think it's something that needs a bit more input um most things like i say there's a lot we get through which are to do with dog bark and it's more people I suppose don't necessarily say want to make a complaint about dog barking but they make a complaint about the welfare side of things it turns out is you know there's no welfare issue there it is just you know it is a dog barking issue so there's a lot of low level things uh if you know if there's some sort of you know if it's a an issue which isn't um which isn't a, a particularly a, a welfare issue then the dog warden may just you know if it's dog barking or you know a dog doing something unusual then uh, or an animal you know some sort of animal issue they can give advice if they go out and they've got concerns uh, then they would um, you know they tend to or I say they because we've only got one now but she tends to liaise with the with the RSPCA if it's a more serious issue uh, and we've got a very good working relationship with the RSPCA so they may go and do a joint visits on it or it may be that the RSPCA take that on if it's quite a Quite a serious issue to be honest we don't get many of those a lot of it is just more probably advice for someone um if you know if they're if they're struggling to know what to do to, to look after a particular animal so a lot of this stuff you know we don't get a lot of serious animal welfare issues and the ones that we do we would work closely with the rspca on that because some of this needs sort of quite expert advice on things um so that's the animal welfare side of things um and then the lot the final thing was the a bit more on the uh, a specific question about uh licensing of dog breeding establishments um and how that fits into dog warden's work and i've covered a bit of that as i've gone through um so i won't go too much more into detail on that but basically like i said earlier we we you know the council or the licensing authority have a duty to license certain things certain um <coughs> types of activities involving animals so dog breeders kennels catteries riding establishments and so forth um and the you know the dog warden will go out and inspect all of those and make sure that they're you know complying with what they should be doing 
um, and they will she will liaise directly with the licensing team in, in terms of the actual physical issuing of the licenses. And like I said earlier, that's quite a technical job, and that's why the dog warden does it because you know the licensing officers, the dog warden's got a good background, obviously in animal welfare, animal behaviour, and um, you know dealing with animals on a daily basis. So um, she is the ideal person to go out and do those inspections. Um, and again, they respond. You know, there'll be lots of you know we do get complaints about premises or if things are unlicensed and so forth. So uh, she will go out and investigate those on behalf of the um of the licensing team so i've sort of rattled through that quite quickly um what i'll do I, I, if anyone's had their hand i apologize but because i'm sharing my screen i can't see i can only see my screen so if i if i switch my screen off now and then i'll i'll hand back to the chair to see if there's any questions thank you dave uh, we have already um councillor phil harvey with a question for you thank you Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you say we have one dog warden. It seems an awful lot of work for one person. So that my first question is, was it a policy decision to have one person or is it simply a recruitment problem? And secondly, uh, a number of places, probably Bridgewater, I, I don't know, um, have things like town rangers or parish rangers. And um, I don't know, is it possible for powers such as enforcement of uh, picking, dealing with dog poo to be passed on to town councils or shared with town and parish councils? Yeah, if I take the first point, the the issue with the with the uh, post issue was it's more resources. We haven't um, we've needed to so that money has been used to support the service in other areas. Uh, the, the sticking point was was that the, the previous dog warden who was doing that post left literally, I don't know, two months before, a month or so before the pandemic started. And obviously, you know, we didn't, there wasn't ability to, or it wasn't appropriate to, say, to recruit at that time. Um, and then the money has had to be used to support other parts of the service um, because obviously there's staffing issues right across, you know, you know, there always is resource issues in whatever you're doing. So that has been used to to, to deal with that, you know, other issues. Um, in terms of the um, delegation of powers, I'm pretty sure we probably could delegate some of those powers. And I know that um, I understand that they're, they're doing, there is some project on the go for some sort of street wardens and things like that in Bridgewater. So we have, you know, I have had discussions with the officers that's dealing with that about yeah. giving sort of delegated powers to those guys to be able to 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 issue these sorts of things so that you know that's been looked at in hand and and yes we probably can um delegate things like town councils and i suspect with the unitary with the unitary coming on coming along there's going to be a, a you know a coming together i suppose of services across the district so at that time it's probably going to be good to you know i suspect that all these issues will be reviewed then and they're looking at things like um these sort of local local area networks aren't they i think where that we you know and, and whether they can whether they can have powers or whether they I, mean, I don't know full detail about what that would involve but whether they can have employ staff or or have the ability to to take on some of this but um but yeah these are things that you know now we're rushing into unitary i think it's probably gonna you know there is going to be a review of everything we're doing so stuff like this can be looked at as part of that um as part of that process. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, Dave. Um, the public spaces protection order. Um, I've got one, one on dogs, um, dated 2017, um, which lasts for three years. Is there a more recent one then than that one? Yeah, there is. We um, we updated that in 20, I think it was 2020. I'll have to check, but there is a new one. We brought a new one in. So that lasts until I think. Until about until the new it goes into the new unitary. So there is that provision there. Um, but I, I do believe there is work going on because obviously everyone across the various districts have got different 
well, potentially different public space protection orders. So I think there's a bit of work going on as one of these unitary work screen work screen work streams to look at how you know about you know I presumably getting some sort of consistency with them and, and updating them and adding you know things that other people might want into them. So so yeah, so there is a new one. I can send you a copy if you if you want a copy of the new one. Yeah, I think that'd be good because in 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 there, there obviously you've got the different parks and play areas, which uh, which says to you to you which dog you know dogs which aren't allowed in there. Um, but on on the dog exclusion areas, um, how do people report for an immediate response? Say for example, parents take the kids to the park after school, and there's dogs in the park which aren't allowed to be there. Because I've had this in the past raised with me. Um, how do they get an immediate response, or do they have to go online, report, and then hope that someone's going to get back to them within the next amount of time? Um, I suppose that's probably you know what would have to happen is they would have to submit a request. Obviously, if there's dog wardens in the area, then they could go out. You know, if someone rang up and said, you know, there's, there's a dog in there causing all sorts of problems and they are available, you know, then they could go there straight away. Um, obviously, if they were in Cheddar and it was in North Petherton, it's probably, on, you know, by the time they get there. Um, but what we would say in that situation is we can, what we tend to do is we tend to target hotspots. So, you know, if there, you know, if someone rings up and says there's this dog in there, then we can, you know, the dog warden can factor that in and do some patrols within that area. Do you, do you see what I mean? So they can go down there. They might not be able to react instantly to it, but they can go down and um, you know if it you know and, and, and look at that parks you know, or, you know put it on a, a list of patrols that they're going to do and try and catch the people doing it. Okay, and just two two last points before I'll give you one go because I'm sure others want to want to ask. Um, you mentioned about no longer educating or going into schools and giving school talks. Um, yeah. um, and part of that you mentioned was to do the curriculum stuff. Um, but schools do tend to have school councils, which act yeah. as a voice for the whole school, and they don't often they don't meet too often. And from my experience attending some of these school council meetings, they often quite welcome um, a, yeah, a different yeah. range of subjects, and they also act as um, a voice for the school, so information kind of be passed down to their to, to their peers. And I wondered if that's something that could be considered. Um, I, I, but I appreciate resources are, are stretched. And then the other point that I want to raise on dog fouling, um, you said that if people are caught, then they get a penalty. And yeah. I suppose it follows on what Phil said about is one person enough to patrol patrol yeah, this. Yeah. Sedgemore is a pretty large area, and I'm part of a Facebook community group. And every day, if someone's mentioning about dog fouling and how horrible it is, how terrible it is, and I wanted to know what sort of anti fouling dog anti fouling measures. Um, you have apart from the patrolling? Um, the first thing we do, I mean, we can issue fixed penalty notices, and when we do that, we will, you know, we will do advertising, you say advertising, but you um, call it publicity around that. Uh, they tend to, there's signage that they put up. Um, in the past, we've done these things where um, they go out and spray, it sounds silly, but they go out and um, spray the dog poo a funny colour so and then put some signs up to you know to raise people's awareness of it and it in that that can be quite effective in that it um you know it will it's almost barrasses people into into clearing up after their dog and we did used to do a bit of work with the um somerset litter free coast which we I, I was involved in running the beaches and we 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 set up the Somerset Litter Free Coast Partnership, which works up at Burnham and those sort of areas. Um, and one of the things that they do from time to time is they also do these sort of dog fouling um, campaigns and so forth. So we've linked into that in the past. So so there's various things we can do. Um, and um, but generally the patrols, you know, if the dog warden turns up on the dog wall, you know, sometimes they'll turn up in the van and sometimes they won't turn up in the van to try and, you know, if the as soon as the dog warden van goes in there, everyone sort of, you know, disappears. But, you know, we sometimes do say, can I say covert patrols, we're not allowed to do that, but they'll just, they won't turn up in the van. She'll just wander around and if she can get, you know, if she catches people, she will issue fixed penalty notices. Um, so, yeah, so I think, this has always been the problem with dog fouling um, is that you can catch people, you can do, um, you can do, you know, say advertising, publicity and that. 
but there is always a die hard of people that will just not clear up after their dog. And actually, sometimes, you know, we found where where that, where the dog owner has intervened in an area, it's not necessarily loads of people doing it. It's just a couple of people that just don't bother doing it. And and that can, you know, it's trying to target those sorts of people. Um, so we will, when, when we have the resources, we will do the patrols and we will, you know, if there's a particular hotspot area you're concerned about, then if you let us have that information, then we will go and, you know, we'll get some patrols down there and see if we can we can nip it in the bud. So and the point about the school councils? Yeah, school councils, um, that's something we could consider. But again, it is really resources because we have such limited resources. Um, it's it's to be an ability to be able to deliver everything. Um, so that's something which, you know, we, like I say, we used to do school talks. They used to go into schools and do the school talks and so forth. But we are quite short of resources to be able to do some of that. Um, but like I said earlier, there is going to be, you know, there is going to be potentially a review of everything we're doing. Well, there will be a review of everything we're doing as part of the uh, part of the, the new Somerset Council. So this could be an opportunity for for looking at things like this. And, you know, there is going to be a review of resources, presumably. And, 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 and this could be something which we can, you know, as a bigger authority, um, maybe there'd be more resources, you know, from the combined approach to be able to deliver some more of these sorts of things. Thank you. In connection with one of um, Councillor Rodriguez's questions, um, do you, in terms of reporting, such as a dog going into a park that's not supposed to be there, are you using those reports to identify the hotspots that the warden will go and check? Yeah. That information is being used. So it's important that people are reporting it through the channels, even if the warden can't get there straight away. Yeah. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. So. I mean, what, what they used to do, I suppose, years and years ago was they used to put they had a huge list of patrols. And they used to patrol every single play park, you know, on a routine basis. Now, we've narrowed that down because it used to be that they go, you know, it wasn't productive doing that because people would go and visit a park. We wouldn't know where when no one ever took a dog. So we now do a, more of a hotspot target approach to use so we can obviously with less resources as well. That means, yeah, if people if people got a problem area and they they send that in then that can be you know the dog will pick that up and say right okay I'll go out and do a patrol in Apex Park this week or Blake Gardens or wherever it is and we can you know pick up the areas where there's a problem rather than trying to trying to blanket approach to patrol everywhere where we're you know we patrol in areas where there wasn't any problems um, yeah. so we can try and target that resource so yeah it's important for people to people to to highlight that and then we can you know the, the resource limited resource we got can be targeted to uh, the particular problem areas great thank you um councillor scott oh, gosh yeah thank you chairman um yeah two things really um that's useful to know actually because um i think um axbridge actually has its fair share of dog fouling and that seems to be yeah. the great topic of conversation so um yeah the more it's reported i guess the more you know, you can come out and check it all out. Um, I quite like the bit about um, maybe giving the town council or somebody locally the um, powers to actually go and spray paint around, you know, the offending item yeah. uh, to draw attention. Um, so that would be good. Um, one thing I was going to ask was um, public space order. Um, is that is there any controls that you can have on public footpaths that are not on um, publicly owned land, but on private land, because we That's often get problems on footpaths. I think private land, I think we have to have the request of the landowner, I think, unless it's a public, if it's a public right of way, I'm pretty sure we can do it on a public right of way. But um, if it's sort of, sometimes we get complaints about things sort of going through a, a landowner's land, but off, off the public footpath, if you see what I mean. So we would potentially have to have their permission to do that. I can find out for you on that. I'm pretty sure public, you know, um, they call them public public rights of way. We're able to, you know, to, to issue fixed penalty notes on those and control them. But obviously, you know, once it verges into private land, then sometimes I have to, you know, it's, it's courtesy to let the landowner know if we know who they are, that, that what's going on. Yeah, thank you. I would be interested, actually. 
that details. Uh, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you for a great presentation, Dave. Um, Councillor Rodriguez had most of my comments um, of it in regards to like um, people posting on Facebook and things like that. I mean, out this way um, from Bridgewater way, we all the villages here, we have problems with dog fouling. Um, I'm just wondering when do the dog wardens work or dog warden, sorry, work um, and so that she can meet people on her patrols? I mean, because out in the villages, most uh, dog walkers are out early morning or late evening. So if she's working um, office hours, she's not going to meet these people that she needs to talk to. Um, second question is, what sort of evidence do you need to prosecute someone? Um, because in the past, people have said you've got to go up in court against your neighbour and say, I've seen the dog mess here and the owner didn't pick it up. Um, and have we also seen um, an increase on the stray dogs since COVID's hit? Yeah, so I take the um, the first point about the times of patrol. So generally the dog warden works nine till five uh, in the week. But we have, you know, if we have in the past, if there are particularly problem areas, then, you know, they've come in early to do some patrols and stuff like that uh, and later on. Um, so there is there is ways of being able to do that. It's slightly more difficult now. We've got less resources. But, you know, if yeah, there's a particular problem area, then we can, you know, they can sometimes, you know, change their working pattern a bit to do some, you know, to do a bit more enforcement. Um, in terms of the evidence, um, if it's a member of the public reporting it and they've witnessed it, then we would need a witness statement from them to be able to um, to be able to issue a fixed penalty notice or um, take them to court. If it's if a dog warden witnesses it, then obviously they can they can gather that evidence themselves from you know their own personal account and 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 be able to do their own witness statements and, and things like that. Um, so so yeah so so we can do that. And I can't remember what your your final question was. Whether we've seen more stray dogs? Yeah. In the um, we have a look at the figures. Uh, just have a look, 78. It's a difficult, it's a difficult one really, because the last two years obviously there have been lockdowns, so it can be quite variable. I don't think we've seen a bigger increase in stray dogs. What we've, I think we've probably had more of, and this is what Dog Warden said to me the other day when I was speaking about it, was we've had more inquiries or phone calls or people coming up through when she's in the parks or whatever asking her how to rehome a dog because people have um people have picked you know a lot more people have bought dogs over lockdown uh and then you know a lot of people are home working and so forth and then suddenly you know they're not necessarily being able to to cope with dogs so they're not necessarily letting out to stray or abandoning it but they're they're more interested in how you know how can they rehome it and so forth and they they you know, she will give a, like I said earlier, we won't, we won't take the dog, we won't rehome dogs because one is, is you know, our, our kennel and contractor would just go mad if we sent him, you know, hundreds of dogs to rehome. And also it's, it's the, the cost involved in it. And, you know, it is, you know, there is a national, I think, issue sometimes with rehoming dogs in the, fact the numbers of them and trying to find places for them. So we won't rehome them, but she, she gives, like I said earlier, she gives advice to people on, where they can, you know, charities to contact and so forth and people that might be able to rehome them. OK, thank you. Um, I don't want to extend this too long, but I think what's coming out of this for me is that it does look as though we are under resourced in this department, but it's hard to know because how are you monitoring performance in terms of response times, number of complaints coming through, number of service requests? Like you say, they've increased since the pandemic because of this issue of more people getting dogs and then needing to rehome them. Um, I'm not quite sure how we're monitoring the performance of this service. Um, and I'm interested to know a bit more about who will be taking this forward in the LGR, under which work stream and in which phase, so that if we yeah. are interested in, in making sure that for our area this service is improved and I'm, I'm assuming that it needs improving, but like I said, I don't really know because we don't have 
figures or ways of monitoring that. We don't have any measurements. So, you know, if, if we could understand how or, you know, what to look out for in the LGR and who to speak to and push for improvements if needed and how it's monitored, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, we do monitor performance across all our services. So this will be monitored as part of the, as you know, it will be under our our, our, our corporate performance standards. So when things come in, we've got, I think it's I don't know, seven working days to respond uh, to initial complaints. Obviously, they, they are triaged. So if it is, you know, stray dogs are prioritised in that we have to pick them up within, uh, I think it's a 12 hour time frame. So we pick them up on that day. Uh, so we've got performance targets for that. We always meet those performance targets for uh, picking up the straight dogs. Um, the dog fouling thing, it's difficult to performance target on that in that it's quite say subjective because it's based on, you know, you can't, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to sort of sit down and say we've had X number of things, we've had X number of this because it's, you know, people are, you know, people will ring up and say generally there's a problem in the area and they'll go out and you or she'll go out and do patrols, etc. So the performance is 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 monitored. I think the issue we've got is that we are doing, you know, the things the things that we're legally obliged to do, we are doing those. Uh, like the stray dogs, we're picking those up within the required standards. But obviously, previously we used to do more than just statutory, so we used to add stuff in. Um, but where where the service has been cut, I still say cut, but where the service has changed is that we don't necessarily have time to do those additional and the microchipping. Um, and, you know, we, we've probably reduced the number of patrols we're doing because, again, that's not necessarily a, you know, we would go down to sort of hotspot patrolling and, and stuff like that. So what we've had to do is shrink, you know, we haven't, we're not, we're not failing as a service because we're meeting what we need to do in terms of, but you're not getting you, there's no added say added value to it there's no you know we there's no additional stuff outside of the sort of legal requirements okay uh, it's good to know that at least our, our minimum service requirements we are meeting that, that's good to have that confirmed yeah. um and, okay. and the dog warden is sorry sorry the dog warden is i mean she is passionate about her job and um you know she she loves a job and you know she will she's happy to deal with the with the difficult issues with the dog fouling she you know she she deals with the stray dog she is you know really you know the licensing side of things she is passionate about it and puts in you know maximum effort into into what she's doing um so i think from that perspective you know i don't think there's a there's an issue in terms of performance in that you know the individual's not you know not performing i think the issue is is that we haven't got that additional because we because the service there's, there's less resource there isn't that um we just can't do the added stuff like the school talks and stuff that we used to do which which you know as part of the part of the bigger service so we've sort of like i said we sh we're still we're still dealing with what we need to do with we're still meeting our performance indicators we're meeting our statutory legal requirements but you know certain things we've had to you know like the patrols we've shrunk the patrols down a bit because you know to so that we are still compliant we, so we can do a bit of everything we've had to sort of shrink it down a little bit in terms of the sort of intensity that we deal with certain things yeah okay my, my comments weren't a reflection on the individual at all it was you know i completely understand there's a lack of resources that, that might be causing that and it's a it's a no frill service now from what is that that's how i would describe it anyway but Okay. Yeah, no, that's right. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, any other questions, anyone, on this one? Can't see any hands raised. Thank you very much, Dave, for your time. Can I ask is, if members have any other questions, they can write to the dog warden directly if they've got any yeah. other questions on this matter? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Bye. Um, and on that point, we're going to go on to the last item of the agenda, and I apologise for the length of the meeting today, guys. Um, agenda item nine, which is the um, the work programme, and I'll pass over to Rose for this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so just sort of briefly, um, as you can see in the agenda pack, the current plan for the September Community Scrutiny Committees is to receive an update on the shopping experience in town centres. Uh, from Nathaniel following on from the committee in, in November and also to look at water quality around the district in terms of who monitor is it, monitors it and what can be learnt going forward 
Um, and alongside that, the committee will also continue to receive ongoing updates and reports, as has been mentioned um, earlier on, on the climate emergency work and ecological emergency once declared. The work programme its, itself um, may be subject to change once there's more information regarding the local government reorganisation in, in the months to come um, or as we get closer to, to next April, which I think has, has been sort of mentioned um, throughout the, the committee today. Um, but scrutiny does um, absolutely still have a role and we will monitor the opportunities for where we can be involved to add value during the transitional period um, up to April next year. Um, along these lines, corporate scrutiny next week is receiving an overview of business as usual and how resources and recruitment are being managed within Sedgemore to ensure that services are still delivered to a high standard for the residents of Sedgemore up until vesting day. But if there are any other ideas from members of the committee for the Community Scrutiny Work Programme, um, I'm happy to take these now or any time by email. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, any input at the moment for that? Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you. Just quickly on the um, shopping experience in, in town centres, I only wondered, it might not be the place for it, but on the key lines of inquiry, is there any way we can ask um, Nathaniel to maybe touch on um, the risks with the unitary in terms of the work that Sedgemore is doing at the moment? Um, and just giving us his view on the, yeah, just really to find out if there's any risks along around those subjects. Yes, that's fine. I, I can include that. I think my understanding, particularly with like the town deal um, projects, is that they are things that would would definitely move over as they are and, and continue um, past vesting day. But yes, that's that's something that we can we can add in there as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. OK, I can't see any other hands raised. So at this point, I'm going to release you all out to the hopefully still sunshine out there um, and go and enjoy the rest of the afternoon and evening. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attendance today. <laughs>